Good evening and welcome tonight to Good News Wednesday Night Bible Study. For those that are with us uh, uh, via Facebook and on YouTube, it is always a blessing to come into your home and invite you into my study as we uh, continue to walk through the Word of God. And so far, <clears throat> we have worked through certain books, we've taken on topics, and uh, now we are studying the book of Acts and we're taking it's a, a long book, so we will take a break. We'll take the first. We're only in the second chapter right now. Actually concluding the second chapter tonight. So we want you to just bear with us. And, and I say each week, too, if there's any comments or anything that you could uh, help us with, let us know how we can better do this broadcast that would be beneficial to you. Uh, please let us know so that we'll be able to um, rightly divide the Word of God and also make it clearly and acceptable and understandable to you. Um, usually a Bible study is usually, you know, the time to change. It says from 7.30 to 8 o'clock, but I extended it now. We first it was going 7.30 to 8.30, but it's now 7.30 to about 8.15, um, just for to shorten the time. Uh, like I said, if there's a request for more time, please let us know or let me know. You can always email me at goodnewschurchpasadena.com at gmail.com if you want to leave a comment or some comments or want to know more about Good News Church. So without further ado, we're going to get on and get right into our study tonight. We like to open up with a word of prayer. And we're always praying for those that we know in need. There are so many things that uh, are going on, uh, especially now just watching the news today, but still this uh, the tension of all this uh, hatred and hate crimes that are going out towards uh, different basic people. Now is the Palestinians and the, those uh, Israelis. So we want to, because of what's going over in the Middle East, to pray for them, pray for our country, pray for our churches, uh, pray for our pastors. And anything I say that, one thing that we need to always be praying for our pastors because they're on the front lines. And a lot of times we don't look at them as being uh, those on the front line, but who are you going to call when someone is sick? Who are you going to call when um, you need some comfort or something like that? Is normally the preacher, the pastor of your church. So we want you to continue to pray for the pastors throughout this world that are sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. And I believe it's any time that we need to is, uh, is today because the time is getting closer to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So without further ado, let us get right into the Word of God. And let's uh, bow with a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we come tonight, Father, just to say thank you, Father. Thank you for another day, another week, Father, that you have brought us to. Another time, Father, you have brought us to uh, share around your word with your people. And we ask you now, O oh God, that if anything that uh, is not of thee, Father, is, uh, uh, we ask your forgiveness now in the name of Jesus. And we want to thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, that continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we ask you right now, Father, that you would look at the hearts and the minds that are hearing the word tonight. Lord, if that heart, that mind that needs to be encouraged and someone has been struggling, we ask you, Lord, that you would be that source of strength to them even tonight. And Lord, we want to pray, Father, for those, O oh God, who um, are struggling, Father, of just trying to find peace in the midst of all this storm. You said you would keep us in perfect peace if our mind has stayed on thee. So we ask you now, O oh God, that you would use this time for your glory and for your honor. And we recover and give your name the praise and the glory. And all God's people said with me tonight, amen and amen. Lord bless you. Once again, we're uh, studying the book of Acts. And uh, one of the things we've said about the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a historical book. Have a lot of uh, history in it. There's not a lot of doctrine in it, but doctrine is intermingled uh, throughout the book of Acts. And you hear the things that we talk about grace and we talk about faith. We talk about justification and sanctification. It's all of it. And the works of Christ is in there, but not strictly taught throughout the book of Acts. More of a historical book about the Acts of the Apostles. We said the first uh, few chapters that we have in there is Peter ministry. Then we have the rest of the uh, book was written by the Apostle Paul. Not written, but speaks about Paul uh, ministry in his journey, his first and second and third missionary journey uh, to the churches of Asia Minor. And one of the things we've said, too, to remind you that the book was written by Luke. is the same Luke that wrote the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. And he picks up where he left off in the ascension of Christ. 
uh, at the death of Christ and picks up at his ascension. So, and uh, I found this screen here that I like. It says, the gospel unleashed. And that is what's happening. In that first chapter, they waited for the Christ to, uh, to be ascended. And then they waited for the second chapter when the Holy Spirit came and the birth of the church. And that's where we went so far. And we come all the way up through that to talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit and how that um, the Holy Spirit came, filled those, 120 were there, and they all began to speak uh, with other tongues. And the people that heard them, heard them in their own language, and they start praising with the wonderful works of God. After that, Peter gave his first sermon, his first sermon, uh, which is a powerful sermon, and he ended that sermon uh, to the point that he convicted the hearts of those Jewish people that were there that said crucify him. And they asked him, one of the things they said in Acts 2 and 38, and they said well, uh, to them, what must they do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we concluded on last week that Peter's sermon, and, that now, and after that, Peter had preached that, and it said that uh, over 3,000 souls was added to the church that day after hearing the gospel message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So tonight we're going to pick up where we left off at. Now that that sermon is preached, the church is born. And where we're going to pick up tonight is in Acts, the second chapter, verses 42 through 47. For those that are with me, we're reading through the uh, ESV, the English Standard Version. So if those don't have you, you can follow with me. Uh, along with that, if not, it's on the screen here. And last week we had some difficult difficulties in the screen. So if it happens tonight, we're just going to keep on teaching. So you pray for us that the Lord will use this time for his glory and for his honor. So let us read. And it reads, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread, and in prayer, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. May the Lord have a blessing to the hearing of his word. And so this is what we're going to be basically talking about uh, today. We're going to be talking about now uh, in this here. Like we said, the church is now born. There are 3,000 souls have been added now. There is a, a fellowship that's, that's uh, among the saints of God. And I've titled this section here that we'll be talking about tonight, The Life of the Church. The Life of the Church. When I say Life of the Church, I'm not talking about the building, but the saints of God. For those that know, the, the, the church is not the building. It is those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are the body of Christ. That is the church. At this time where we're at, there is 3,120 people now in the church. And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. But in the life of the church, and one of the things tonight what I will be doing is a little different. As I talk about these verses here uh, from 40, 42 to uh, 47, I will be speaking, first of all, in the first couple of, of verses, they're talking about the life of the church and some of the things that, will really uh, need to take on the life of the church, and it gives it to the growth that it needs. And I will kind of elaborate a little bit more about some than others, because it's a passion of my heart in realizing that uh, God is causing the church not to be stagnant, but God is about addition, not subtraction. He's about growth, not uh, destruction. So, and hope you pick that up as we go through the book of Acts. He's constantly adding to his church. So, uh, and then also, the second part of this Bible class tonight, not only there was a sermon that I preached uh, out of this same text some years ago uh, about this, and I'm going to kind of interwing that into this here. So, you're going to have tonight a kind of a dualism. Uh, you get the uh, few verses that we will talk and teach a little bit about. Then other, I'm going to walk through this sermon that I preached and kind of help you get some applications to that. 
So to jump right into it, the very first thing, the life of the church. What is the life of the church? What is it that gives life of the church? And we found that in the very first verse we have of this text of Acts 2, 42. And it reads, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayer and the prayers. Now, one of the things we're going to say here, why this is very important, in this one verse is what I believe is the life of the church. When I say the life of the church, that's what makes the, the church grow. This is what makes the church be vibrant is these things that we have in here. And um, a few years ago when I said I preached this text, I, I spoke to, uh, and I'm going to speak tonight a little bit later about this in here. And I, it helps me to think with the church of Jesus Christ need to understand about our personal goals should be in Christ. When you accept Jesus Christ, it's other than just being saved. Why are you here? He, he said in Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive what? Power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What was the reason of that power to come? Not for you just to sing a song, not for you to walk around and, and, and say you're saved, but to be a witness for Jesus Christ into this dead world. People would not know Christ unless they see it in us. And one of the things that we see happen in this very first church is there's some things that really uh, stuck out the life of the church that opened people's eyes. And I believe today we need some of the same things. But I want to say this up front. What has been uh, my understanding throughout the church and the years I've been pastoring, uh, and one of the things when I first started pastoring, it used to be a burden to me. I thought it was my job to do this right here with Christ, have, and that was to build the church. But Jesus Christ has already stated uh, who was to build the church in Matthew 16, 18. For those that you may be listening to me, if you're a pastor or maybe you're a deacon or maybe you're an usher or maybe you're in an evangelism ministry or whatever capacity that you're serving in the church and your burden is you're trying to build the church. Now, I'm not saying that you're not supposed to share the good news, but the burden to build the church is not yours. Here it is. It says here, uh, the burden of the church is uh, taken from Matthew 16, 18, uh, when Jesus says, And I tell you, uh, he said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will do what? I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what is the burden of the church? It is to what? To build. It is Christ's job to build the church. It is not my job. It is not your job. Christ will. Now, how are we to do it? We are to share the good news. Even tell Paul tells us later in the book of Corinthians, one man planted, another water, but it's what? God that gives the increase. So it's our job to share it. Or if somebody has heard it, it's our job to water it. But it's not our job to grow the church. It is our job to be a witness for Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. But in today's, till we live here, there are many books and conferences you can go to that teach you how to build the church. And, uh, you know, it is amazing to me when... Right here before us in the text today, we have one of the, uh, this is Christ's, this is God's design for building his church. And he uses it right here in, few, in a few verses, in the closing chapter of this second chapter of Acts, is God's design to build his church, or what the life of the church should be. And it tells us here what it is. They devoted themselves to the teaching of apostles' doctrine, and fellowship and in breaking the bread in prayer. And, and the very first thing we're going to talk about here is that what it is when it says that they, they were devoted to the teaching of uh, God's word or to the apostles' doctrine, which was really what they didn't have the written scriptures like we had. They had the Old Testament, but what they had is the power of the Holy Spirit in them and the apostle being filled with the Holy Spirit spoke the word of God with boldness, just like Peter did, quoting the Old Testament. And brought back when he brought Joel in that first part and preaching to them, told them about the when those men were drunk. He said, No, this is the prophecy of Joel that God will pour out his spirit in all men. Peter didn't have that written down, but the Holy Spirit gave it to him at that time. So, one of the things in the life of the church is the teaching of the word of God. And that is what we want to talk about here. It is the word of God. And when I titled the sermon, uh, uh, the series that I preached, it was called Church Relationships Has a Powerful Witness. And one of the things that have a powerful witness is because the church is built on the teaching of the Word of God. And when we talk about here, 
and it says in that very first verse when it said, and they, when we talk about it, the they that those are, uh, when it said they devoted themselves, or those who had put their faith in Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. As you remember, there was 120 people in the upper room, and they were waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But after the Holy Spirit came upon them, they started speaking the word, uh, in, in tongues, and, and the people heard them, and uh, it says there was over what? 3,000 people after Peter had preached that came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So you figure, right now, the church at this point, before we're into the text in this 42 verse, there are 3,120 people that the Holy Spirit used to create right relationships that would have a powerful witness for Jesus Christ in the world. To think about that, it was 120 people first, which was basically mostly were Jews, but they were women, men, and all was all together in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came. But after they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and started to talking about the wonderful works of God he was doing, and then Peter preached a sermon and 3,000 got saved. Now think about it. It was people from Mesopotamia, uh, Pontus, and all these different places, Cappadocia, all these people that were there. So this, this 3,000 people that got saved that day was from all walks of life. And these people that, now one of the things there, these people here that were part of that church, they had now suffered hatred from their family, persecution, but for putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Because if you were a Jew and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you was excommunicated from your family. They don't have nothing to do with you. So these people here were suffering persecution from family and friends for putting their faith in Jesus Christ. But what kept them is that what? It said they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostle doctrine. And the word I want to key on that we talked about in that 42, 42nd verse, when it says here, they devoted. That word devoted is another word meaning they were committed. Let me say this. Here's what we have. A lot of people that say they put their faith in Jesus Christ. They may be devoted to uh, saying they're Christian. They may be devoted to a church. But one of the things that you need to be devoted to is committed to the Word of God. And that's what it said. They were devoted or committed themselves to the apostles' teaching. And let me ask you a question as we even go through this tonight. What are you committed to? Are you committed to uh, just a local church? Are you committed to a fellowship? Are you committed to the Word of God? And this is the thing here because Jesus even and told us that uh, the teaching of the word of God, those are not just the hearers of the word, but those doers of the word, we're told by James. But look what, uh, what it says here in James and John uh, 8 and 31. This is what Jesus says here, and this is where it puts the rubber where it meets the road. Because there are a lot of people that say they're a Christian, that say that I put my faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus says that he defines who's really his. He says here in John 8 and 31, Jesus talking to the Jews said, Jesus said, to the Jews who had believed him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. And let me go and say this here. Remember, because I explained a while back, for those that are with me, we were talking about abiding in Christ. That word abide means to be at home, to dwell in. It's a word of permanence. So in other words, Jesus said, he said to those Jews, if you abide, in other words, if you are at home in my word, and my word is at home in you, truly you're my disciple. Not just because you listen to Pastor Whitehurst on Wednesday night, just because you are a member of a church, but no, you got to abide in the Word of God. And one of the things we said here, uh, I said that first church, part of the life of that church was what? They were what? Devoted or they were committed to the teaching of God's Word. The Word abided in them. They were committed to the apostles' teaching, which is the Word of God. And this is foundational. To any true church. Now, if you're a true church, you're not built on anything. It is the word of God that is the authority and that what should be taught for the spiritual growth and the maturity of the faith. Not how often you give, how often you come to the church, or, or how many doors you open up in the church, how many times you sing in the choir. That is that what makes you a, a authentic Christian. Because there are a lot of people who sing, a lot of people open the doors of the church, a lot of people in there but they are not abiding in the word of God. And he said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. So my question to you, are you truly abiding in the word of God? That abide, letting the word be at home in you. 
Abide means you're applying it to your everyday life. In other words, if you're having a struggle on the job, do you go to somebody else or do you go to the Word of God and find the strength for it? In the midst of conflict, he says that he, his Word is a lamp unto our feet and a what? A light unto our pathway. Right? So, what are we saying here? And, as, and if we're in Christ, let me say another thing about the apostles' doctrine here. Remember, the church had just been born. So these people here, it's just like a baby. When a baby is born, they need to be fed. And what were they feeding off of? The Word of God. Like Peter. Peter tells uh, us in 1 Peter 2 and 2. And this is to those, if you first come, you have just come to faith in Jesus Christ, or you find yourself not growing, here's probably the reason why. It said, like newborn infants, Long for the pure spiritual milk that you may, that by it you may grow up into salvation. And so, what are you saying here? Now, but what they were doing, they are, by them abiding in the Word of God, they are, was uh, devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. This shows that they were true saints. They were hungering for the Word. And I like in this verse here that word pure, the sincere, not just your favorite scripture, but the pure, unadulterated Word of God. The kind of verses that sometimes you read scriptures that deal with sin in your life, you deal with it. Then there's time you read a scripture and it gives you joy. The pure word of God is not compromised. You're giving it the way God said. That's why he said, preach the word. The word is a definite article, meaning God's word. Not how you want to say it, but as God intended it to be said. This is what he said here. And that's why they were committed to that. The apostles taught it and they continued in it daily. It wasn't just a one-time thing. And saints of God... And for the life of the church today, when I'm not saying in the local church, but it's the body of Christ. We ought to all abide in the word of God, and especially in the law, the pure church today. They were not only the second thing they were committed to, they were committed to fellowship. They were in the first church, they were committed to the apostles' teaching. That means uh, they stood daily uh, studying God's word, uh, being taught the word of God, uh, hearing it expound, applying it to their lives. And also, secondly, they were committed to fellowshipping, and which is a, that word fellowship comes from the Greek word kontonia, which means partnership or sharing. Now, one thing I believe that is lost today, and especially during the time we've been living where churches were shut down and people have gotten comfortable at home, people have forgotten that fellowship is part of who you are. You are part of the body of Christ. My head can't stay home without my neck. My neck needs my shoulders. My shoulder needs my body. My body needs my hips. My hips need my legs. My leg needs my ankles. My ankles need my feet. All of it work together. And we need the fellowship. And I know, you know, I'm going to park here just for a moment because this is just something that really burdens me now that we can come to church. You know, for the most part, and especially when we trust in Jesus Christ, I know there was a time that there was some fear that going on and people was very hesitant about it. If anything, it's time for us to be back in the fellowship with the, ch with the church. People don't think they need to come to fellowship with the saints. And I say, if you're part of a body, you need to be together. Now, let me say this is This is our spiritual duty of the true church. Why? Because we help one another. You can't stay at home. If I'm, I'm burning down, you, you may be blessed and you're to help me. You can't help me if you're at home. We're helpers one of another. And to show you, I'm not just talking off of my head. I'm going to show you. This is an obligation. This is your spiritual obligation as a body of Christ. That's the reason why there's no solo Christians or you can't stay at home by yourself and I don't need to go to church and I can do that. No, you need the body. If you are saved, you and you belong to Jesus Christ, you need to be part of a local fellowship. And I say that to those out there who feel, well, I accept the Christ, but I don't need to go to church. No, you don't need to go to church to be saved. But once you get saved, you ought to be part of a local fellowship of the saints because we grow together. And let me just show you through the scriptures here. Because it said that first church, part of the life of that church was what? They continue or devoted to the teaching of the apostles' doctrine, which is the word of God. Secondly, they were uh, devoted to fellowship. And here's what uh, in the book of Hebrews it tells us. And here's where I come to the point. And I want to say, this is an obligation to you that are out there. If you haven't been in the church or you got some fear, man, if you got a health condition where you can't come, I can understand. But it's time for you to get back in the fellowship with the saints. Here, look what it says here in Hebrews 10 and 24 and 25, talking about fellowship, coming to church. He said, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good work. 
Now, consider he says here, this means, look, this is what you do when you come to church. How you're going to stir up one another and to love and to good work. You can't love me at home. You can't stir me up and help me at home and do good work at home. How are we going to do it? It says here in verse 25, by not neglecting to meet together as is a habit of some. In other words, and I like the King James said, we have to forsake not to assemble ourselves together as a manner of some is. I like that because it kind of gives a little strong meaning. But here I like where it says also not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Some people put it on, oh, I don't need to go to church. No, it's time for you to get back into the fellowship. Why? We need one another. We help one another. I need you. You need me. And if you're in your local church and uh, your pastor needs to hear you, your deacon's there, or you're serving, or if you have a gift in the ministry, you can't serve. Use your gift to the body if you're at home. Come on, somebody. I, I, I know I may lose some people there, but now he said, not the forsaken. He said, not neglecting to meet together as the sum is. Then he goes on and says here, but here, here's what we're supposed to do. The reason why we need fellowship, we are to what? But encouraging one another. You can't encourage me at home. Now, I know you can give me a call, but it's good to see your face. And he says, and all the more as you see the day drawing nigh, which means we don't know tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. As we realize that we see all these things that are going on in the world, we need to come together to encourage each other, to fellowship and to strengthen one another. Because these are some trying times. Amen? And we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So the third thing they did, not only were they faithful to the word of God, to the apostles' teaching, secondly, to fellowshipping of the saints, and this is what I'm talking about, the life of the church. This is what the life of the church is to be. If a church is going to be successful, it ought to be faithful to the teaching of word, God's word. It is the authority in the word of God. And it's in fellowship in the same means that the saints, you don't have to beg them to come to church. They come to church because they want a fellowship with the saints. They need each other. And brothers and sisters, I want to beat that drum loud tonight. We need to come together to fellowship with one another. And the third thing that we they did they were faithful in communion, in communion. And what she said, and here's one of the verses before I even go on. I want, I want to, here's a, something I, uh, I read that I wanted to uh, say about fellowship. For those here that feel, well, I don't need to fellowship. I don't need to come into church. Well, this is more important. All these different things that, the excuses. And I know during this time here, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of teaching that's going on. What do we need to do to, uh, because the things have changed. The new norm is people are going to stay at home. True saints want to fellowship with the saints. Amen. I, I know that, that you can stay at home and watch TV. But you know what? We need each other. We need to pray for one another. Support one another. We need to sing praises together. Worship together. And look here. I found this reading here. And this is a very strong saying. As we, Before I go on. And he says here. For a Christian to fail to participate in the life of the local church is inexcusable. Love it, love it, love it. In fact, those who choose to isolate themselves are disobedient to the direct command of Scripture. I like that. And listen to what he's saying here. For those who feel, I don't need the fellowship, I don't need to go to church, well, I can't go now because all this pandemic stuff, that, that, that's it. The Bible says, God have not given us a spirit of what? Fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Right? So we said, we know at the time it was this, this uh, pandemic thing was foreign to all of us. But we know now God is in control. God has kept us and provided for us here. So it's time to come back into the fellowship. But listen to what he says here. For a Christian to fail to participate in the life of the local church is inexcusable. In fact, those who choose to isolate themselves are disobedient to the direct command of Scripture. What was we saying? Forsaken Forsake not to assemble yourself together as a manner of some is. And then also in the verse 42, he tells us here that they were committed to not only to, com but to communion. And it says they were committed to the breaking of bread, which is a communion, which is a reference to the celebration of the Lord's Supper or communion. And, and, and this is not optional for us as Christians. Some of us think, well, well, I don't need to. And I'm just going to take it back. If we hear it read, uh, on the first Sunday of some churches, you know, you, they do it every Sunday. Some say, and the scripture says, often as you do this, do this, remember me. In order for you to do that, and remember, really, this was done when we was among the saints. During the pandemic, I know we used uh, where we would do it on air, say, get your cracker. But now that the doors are open, we ought to commune together. 
Come to commune with Christ together, the bread and the juice. The bread that represents the body of our Lord and Savior, the juice that represents the blood that was shed for remission of our sin. But look what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 24 to 29. And I wanted to read it because I wanted you to see, this is what the church ought to be committed to. This is the life of the church. What? The, the apostles teaching, being committed to the word of God. Secondly, committed to fellowshipping. A church that's going to grow and going to have an impact. It's going to be fellowshipping. The saints are going to be staying home. They're going to be coming. And then they're going to come and commune. In 1 Corinthians, it tells us here. And Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, who was a problem church, and he had to correct some things. He said, and when, and when he had given things, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Talking about the bread. Do this in remembrance of me. This is what he said. You notice that it's not optional. He said, when you do this, you're doing it in the remembrance of what? Of what Christ has done for you. Then he said, in the same way he took the cup after saying, this cup is a New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The bread is the body for which Christ has done for you. He said, when you do it, do it in remembrance of him. The bread. He wants us to commune. This is not optional. As a believer, we ought to do well to commune together around the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. It is a witness to the world about the death and the burial of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then he said, Whoever therefore eat this bread or drink this cup in the Lord unworthily manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. But here's something we need to all do. And I say that if you're avoiding the one of the things I used to always when I was coming to faith was see why why would the church always be packed on the first Sunday? And and in most of the churches I would go to. Why? Because people would come. They were committed to communion. And I think that's really good. But you know, don't just come on the first Sunday and say, Oh, I took communion, I don't need to come for the rest of the week. Remember, this church, the first church, and a life of a church is listening to the word of God, it's being taught, and it's being expound. Secondly, fellowshipping among the saints, and thirdly, they're communing. But then he says, when you do that, make sure here, let a person examine himself then, so that when he eat the bread and drink the cup, for anyone who eats and drink without discerning the, the body, eats and drink judgment on himself. Three things in the life of the church. The life of a church, they committed to the preaching of God's word, and the teaching of the words of the apostle, to fellowshipping with the saints, the third thing is communion. This is what the life of a church is all about. It's, and it's, this, this is not, these things are not optional if we're going to be the body of Christ. And the fourth thing we find here is, and one of the things I come to here was the weakest area in the average church, which is here. They were, and this church here, the first church, was committed to prayer. And we need to be committed to prayer. And, you know, we can have food fest, we can have choir singings, we can have dinner day, and we can pack a church. But when it comes down to just the regular uh, teaching of the Word of God, like Bible study, or when it comes down to a prayer meeting, it's usually the weakest uh, time of the church. But uh, So not only but they were committed, these four things they were committed to, which is the life of the church, they were committed to believe what Jesus said here. And they understood. Remember what Jesus told us here when it comes to prayer. And these, some of these disciples that were there, 120, and now the new one, they were taught what Christ has said. And what did he say in Luke 18 and 1? And this same thing go for us. And he told them, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, and he said, he spoke to them in parables to the effect that they ought always to what? Pray and not lose heart. In other words, you don't always be praying. Prayer should be a part of our everyday. I like to say prayer is the, light, is the air that we breathe as Christians. Because we're talking to God, and then it's God talking to us. It's constantly being communion with Him. Not walking around talking, but knowing you're in the presence of Him. And not losing heart. When you're praying for something, maybe it's not happening now, but don't lose heart. God is going to come in His own time. And not only that, there's another verse, I believe, that the first church understood. And that was what Jesus said to His disciples also in John 14, in verses uh, 13 and 14. And He says, what, whatever you do in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is what he says here. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Twice he said that. Look what he said. Whatever you 
act in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified. This is Jesus really saying the reason why prayer ought to be part of, let me say something. You know, as the doors of the church are open now here, in your own personal life, you ought to have a time of prayer, but also in the body of Christ. There should be a corporate time of prayer when we're coming together, praying for God's will to be done. There, we got unsaved loved ones that we need to be at the altar for, praying that God will save them. Do you know that's the will of God? He said, if you ask anything according to my will, you, he said, you know if I hear it, if you pray, you know you have what you ask for. And he, so he said he's not long, he's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. So we need to ask, start asking God. And he said he would do it. Why? Not for you, but that the Father may be glorified in his son, Jesus Christ. Then he reassured it and said the second time, for those who don't pray, he says here, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, what more than that to be committed to prayer? So, the life of the first church was what? In these first, in that very, I only got into verse 42. I haven't really got into the whole text, and my time is running short, so I really won't get whole much into that sermon. But I wanted to really build this here. This is what, uh, you know, we have all these church growth seminars. This is true church growth. You went from 42 to 47, to me, is what church growth is all about. And I, I know myself as a pastor for years. I remember my first start church that I'm on now. I'm pastoring a church. My This is the fourth church, which is the second church that I pastor. I pastor this church that I'm pastoring now 22 years ago. And here it is. I'm back at that church. Now, uh, only through God's will that I ended up back there. But what I'm saying this is here is that in his, early in my ministry, I thought it was because I had to preach. I, it was my job to grow the church. That is not my job. It tells us over in the book of Ephesians, my job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. That is my job, is to teach you that you would do the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? Use the gift that God is telling you to be a witness for him. And that's what I hope I'm doing to those that are listening to me tonight. If you're, you're part of Good News Church or wherever your local church is, then you realize it is your job to what? To do the work of the ministry. Christ is going to build the church. And that, I was so glad when he took that burden off of me. So now I preach and I teach the word. And my prayer is that you would grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But it's old saying, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. I had to learn that. So all I'm doing is filling the water trough. It's up to you to drink it and to grow by it. Amen? Come on, somebody. So that was the final thing we had here. So, And, and I don't know about you, but that's, that's good news to me. And... Um, I'm going to hit it. We only got about five minutes. I'm just going to talk just for a moment. Uh, reason why I really kind of talked about this sermon here that I, I preach, um, which when it says church relationships is a powerful witness. And um, just kind of an introduction. I'll speak a little bit about it here and why I said that church relationships is a powerful witness is based on those four things I just talked about. Because when you see, think about it, there are 31 Hundred people, 3,120 3, people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ in the midst of persecution and being uh, excommunicated for their families. They, they still, they were committed to what? These people here under persecution was committed to the teaching of God's word. They were committed to fellowshipping from one another. And they went from house to house. They didn't go to church or church building. They were committed to communing, communing God's supper, and they were committed to prayer. That, and can you imagine, that, that's a powerful witness. The world see all these people from different walks of life coming together, going house to house, breaking bread. That's a powerful witness. And that's how I came up with this uh, theme for this series that I preached. But one of the things here, just kind of a, uh, that's a little way to, as I conclude this, and I'm going to jump real fast to the end. And to say in the introduction, it says here, the church of Jesus Christ has been given a, a bad rap because of the people in the, how people in the church treat each other. Let me say that. There are people, unsaved people don't want to have nothing to do with the church because they have watched the so-called Christians who claim to know Jesus Christ as Lord and the Savior uh, live rides of life with attitudes and treating each other negatively because, and they, they've seen it. They come to the church and they see how things are going on, how people putting down their pastor, trying to control their pastor, doing all these different things, are or, or, or dominating or, or taking sides or cliques in the church. All these things here turns off the unbeliever. When If we're committed to teaching, fellowshipping, and communion, and uh, prayer, we don't have time for that other stuff. Here, 
And when an unbeliever sees attitudes and actions within the church, they don't have no parts of it. So in the text that we're going to be dealing with, which I won't get a chance to get to tonight, is a good example of knowing that the Holy Spirit is controlling the church. It's not because, and one of the things where this church is grow, growing, it wasn't because the pews are full, it wasn't because the choir is great, the preacher is eloquent, the building was beautiful, and, uh, and there are no all programs going to the church. This church is not growing because of those things. People say, well, this church is good because the pews are full. They had a good choir. The preacher was eloquent. The building was beautiful. And they had all these programs. But let's go back. You think about this first church. There was no pews, no choir. And the preachers of that day was unlearned. And there was no building. But one thing this church did have is people who were controlled or filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what called the ministry of this first church to be in an impact. And, if they, and they weren't worried about what people were doing or what they wasn't doing. They were only making sure that everybody's needs were being met. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But I'm going to stop right here. It's something that was told to me by uh, Bishop Benjamin Reed, who is now going home to be with the Lord. One day he was running a revival for me at Good News Church. This is over maybe now, maybe over 20 years ago. He was preaching a revival for me at Good, Good News Church when he was a pastor of First Church of God over in Inglewood. And he told me, he says, he says here, that if you want a biblical church, this is what the words of um, Benjamin Reed, and I remember writing it down. He said, if you want a biblical church, don't grow around the choir, the preacher, or the building, but on the power of the Holy Spirit in the people of God. I love that. Well, that's the reason why. If you want to grow a church, you want to see a church grow, don't build around your building. Don't build around a great choir or the, the personality of the preacher. Build it around spirit-filled people because that is what. Why? Why? Because they're going to know four things that those spirit-filled people, people are going to want. They want the what? Pure teaching of the Word of God. They want to come to the fellowship with the saints. They want to commune. And they want to what? Spend time in prayer together. And church, when you see this, that's what you know. We don't have a whole lot of spirit-filled people in the church. Why? First of all, they don't want a fellowship. Secondly, they don't want to what? Spend time in prayer. They say it's too much preaching. They'd rather have more singing and more praise and things like that. When the God built, he said, he used the foolishness of preaching to save those that were lost. Amen? And I'm going to stop right there. I don't want to get too much in it because I won't really get a chance to. But I will next week deal with more of that sermon I preach where it says church relationships is a powerful witness. And why that is? Because spirit-filled people that were faithful to the apostles' teaching, they were faithful to uh, fellowshipping in the, with the saints, they were faithful and committed to a time of com spending time in communion, and they were faithful in prayer. God bless you, God. Keep you is my prayer. So until we come together next week, we want you to continue to pray for us and we're praying for you. And if this has been a blessing to you, we always want to tell you to remember to uh, like us and, and on Facebook and also um, subscribe to us on YouTube. And remember, the church doors are open at Good News Church. Our worship services on Sunday mornings at 8.30 to 9.45. Uh, we prayed, and one of the things we said, everybody is somebody at Good News in the eyes of the Lord. We would love to have you in our fellowship. Basically, we talked about it tonight. We're obligated. This is not optional for us to just stay at home. It's time to get back in the fellowship with the saints. So until then, let's come together. Let us close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, which is truly a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We pray tonight, Father, that something was said tonight, Father, as we talk about what the true church is really all about. It's not about fancy building. It's not about elegant preachers. It's not about beautiful buildings. It's not about uh, the personalities of the individual, but it is about the Holy Spirit empowering the people who are committed to His, your word and committed to a time of prayer, committed to communion and committed to fellowship in one another. Lord, we ask tonight, Lord, that you would use this word and this as a word of encouragement and in the Bible study tonight to speak to those hearts or those feeling, well, I, I don't want to go to church. I can't go to church. Lord, that for them to now it's time to Get, use their gift. The gift is not for them, but it's for the body of Christ. So, Lord, help us to come together again. And we pray, Father, that as we go into the, the ending of this month, Father, and this Memorial Day coming up on next week, re reflecting of all those lives that were lost 
during this pandemic time and those who have served and on the front line, front lines and those out there, Father, who are still serving and those who are contemplating on who has fear, Father, even taking this vaccine. We pray, Father, realizing that you are the true bomb in Gilead, Father. You are, you are Jehovah Rapha. You can do anything but fail. So we want to thank you tonight, Father, for what you have done, for what you are doing, and what you will do in your local body, even at Good News Church. So until we come together again, Father, be with us and keep us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Remember to be with us next week, and we'll talk more about how church relationships is a powerful witness using Acts 2, 42-47. Have a blessed evening.